All right. I finally just figured out the problem, by the way. Remember how we had a couple of those shows where we had some kind of noises in the periphery? So yeah. when you yeah. and I do ACL Live, um, anytime I hit a commercial or hit, hit uh, you know, some you know, commercial mutes or some sort of, yeah, it mutes everything. Mm -hmm. And what I found out was when I hit the capper, our little music thing, yeah. is that it, there's a delay. There's a delay before it kicks into effect. Uh, okay. So once it kicks in, yeah, just like everything else, it mutes it. But until it kicks in, so our mics are hot there for about the first hmm, three to five seconds before nice. the, before it actually kicks in. Yeah. So. Yeah, it's you know, so funny, man. Make Since sure that, you don't say anything, make sure you, you don't know, say anything that you're going to regret. In the first Since that years. happened once with the cough, every time our music comes on, I, 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 I just know. all I want to do is cough. Just letting I you know. know. I'm the same way. It's, it's same ridiculous. Way. How are uh, you? Welcome, I feel like I just welcome saw you. Into, welcome into uh, Borderline, episode number 104. So we're rocking and rolling. Had uh, wow. had episode 100 a few weeks ago, a month ago now, I believe. And then uh, 104 episodes, man. Think about that. I know it's really cool, isn't it? It's yeah, over two years. It's, it's been over two years. Yeah. It's pretty impressive. Yep. And I like, Usually I like people we, we've, just, by now. we've just knocked them out this year. I don't even think we've taken a week off, have we? If we have, uh, didn't we take a couple weeks off during all that travel or no? I don't know. I think we were pretty good about knocking them out. I mean, even just popping on real quick, even if it was yeah. just to, you know, just kind of recap something and kind of give yeah. our thoughts. I think we did, did a pretty good job. And I love that. You know, I mean, you and I mentioned Colin Cowherd from time to time, you know, a sports talk guy that we listen to. And and I like I like how I like how Colin he will take some random days off, but he'll work on a Memorial Day. He'll work on a Labor Day. Sure. Sometimes he'll work on a Fourth of July if it falls during the week, and he'll take some different days off. Yeah. I was kind of looking at our I was kind of looking at our schedule. You know, if you want, I mean, we'll we'll be on next week because it'll still be well shy of Christmas, and then we we might even be able to pop on and do one the week of Christmas because it's actually well, not we'll be on in, Christmas Day, but but it might be a travel day. For yeah, me. it'll be. Oh, that's right. It'll be the day before Myrtle. Yeah, so we'll probably yeah. miss that. We'll probably miss the last week of the year. Yeah. Oh, by the way, getting back to Colin. Be. Remember how we yeah. talked about how we've talked about it off air. We've talked about it on air. The worst thing you can be in professional sports is irrelevant. Yes. He was actually talking about the Panthers. Apparently, it's gotten out that people and staffers within the organization are telling coaching candidates, "Don't come." Oh my gosh! It's that big of a train wreck. It's so toxic. Don't come here. Well, I told you when we were talking about this off the air the other night that, uh, and by the way, just kind of just kind of pull back the curtain so we can let people. Uh, Colin was saying that, by the way. That was on Colin's show. Yeah, that's, that's what, what I was that's saying. Kind of, that's relevant. Yeah, that may all of a sudden made him relevant, but it makes it awful too. But yeah, it's interesting. Uh, again, for those of you new to the show or maybe hopping on, didn't didn't hear that show. Bernie and I talked about this. Um, and I, I mentioned this years ago back when I was doing the sports talk radio show in Kansas city, cause the Royals, I was doing the pregame show for the Royals and they were terrible. And, yeah. uh, and something that we would talk about, uh, unfortunately in Kansas city was, you know, you can be a terrible team, right. And still be relevant. <laughs> yeah. I E the Cubs for many, many years, uh, the Cowboys. Red Sox until the Red Sox until 2004. Yeah. The yeah. Cowboys, I mean, Cow Cowboys had what three playoff wins since 1995. So, I mean, they well, there was a stretch there. They just weren't very good, but yet they were always yeah. talked about. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, so you can still be relevant and be bad. And obviously when you're playing really well, um, everyone's talking about you, but the worst thing that can happen to you as a sports franchise. And again, we've talked about this before is being irrelevant. And that's yep. again, what's happened to the Kansas city Royals. No one really cares about that. small markets and small and markets now, are bad. And now, yeah. And, and now I mean, yeah, but, and now I, I know this is just going to be, you know, people closer to home here in the Carolinas. Uh, but yeah, I mean the Charlotte Hornets, the Charlotte, uh, uh, I mean, the Carolina Panthers, I mean, the, basically the Charlotte yeah. sports scene has just whoosh, awful. Yeah. So bad. Off the, Unless off you like grid. soccer. Soccer's good. <laughs> right. <laughs> I mean, they, they, they exceeded. Way to go, guys. Yeah. But, uh, I mean, it's it's bad. And to have, if that's true, I mean, Colin wouldn't say it unless he had some sort of feeling that it was true. And that, sources uh, I mean, to back it yeah, up. And, yeah. And you've got, you've got people inside an organization Telling other people not to come, don't come here. Yeah, and that's crazy. That's bad. That's super bad. That is bad. That is bad. And and I told you that uh, when I was doing a basketball game recently, I ran into a couple of local radio guys in the Charlotte area, and um, and uh, you know, unfortunately, Tepper is just not. He, he 
just sounds like he's just not, I don't know if he, I don't know if he's not likable or just not popular or what, but you know, he's, he's, yeah. he's done a, and, and, you know, I, I caution, you know, I, I guess a word of caution was saying some of this, cause I don't have all the facts. You might know more than I do. Stacy doesn't want to talk about it rightfully. So, um, but you know, what's happened between Tepper and the whole rock Hill area has been really yeah. unfortunate. And again, I, I don't, I, I don't have enough knowledge to take side for the Rock Hill side. And it sounds, it, you know, it sounds terrible, but, uh, you know, but I, I haven't heard, I, I'm not friends yeah. with her or any of his people, so I don't know. But it sounds like it was a terrible situation. At the end of the day, you know, he, he really needs, he really needs to endear himself to the South. I think Hill. he wants out. I think he's, I think country. all this is, I think all this is on purpose. I bet it's, I bet a city like Oklahoma city has the Panthers within two years. Oh yeah, that's right. You think this is uh, all part of the master plan to move the team. I don't trust people, Jeff. And this yeah, this seems exactly no, how no this is this is exactly how you would do it, right? You get to a point, you know, you have to ask the city for money because it's got the second oldest stadium. You know, you have to do that. So ruin yeah. everything you have in the city and the franchise, basically. And then when you ask for the money, the city's going to say no because you know they're going to say no. And then once they do say no, you can say, well, I'm going to look around. And a city like Oklahoma City that doesn't have NFL that would love it there will jump up and give him whatever he wants. Yeah. And then well, that can, would be that would be that would actually be a good market for it because football is just crazy yeah. popular. And then they would build whatever they build whatever, that. He'd build whatever stadium he wants. He'd have control of it. He would have everything he's ever wanted. Yeah. Oh, he would. So oh, that, he'd be the man. But yeah. but uh, so I was going to say, you know, about about endearing yourself to to your neighbors across the border. That's that, I feel like that's what the Kansas City Chiefs did such a great job of. That entire family did such a good job of endearing themselves to the people of Jackson County, Missouri, and Johnson County, Kansas. I mean, again, that stadium's right close to the border, right? Yeah. And and yeah. and your and Chiefs fandom, you know, Chiefs kingdom, is it, is is it crosses the border, and so they've done sure. a really good job of of trying to, at least in my opinion, they've done a really good job of trying to get both sides together to help pay for everything. And, you know, for the, for the health and the, and the future of the Panthers, you would think you need to do the same, but maybe, you know what, Bernie, you could be, you could be a hundred percent right. That this Someone is write, it, write it down. To, it's a ruse, man. It's a way to get out of a situation. It gives him at, at some point he'll have legal standing to make a move. If things keep going this way, he'll find a way to make it legally. Okay. And this I, this, I, this it, should totally be a part of your on, off, and in segment at some point. It should, at some, get, two get, years get, from now, we're, we're, we're on 208, and they've moved, and Charlotte is in complete yeah. despair because they lost their NFL team. And by the way, a city that size, they're not coming back. They got the Hornets back. They're not getting NFL back. So if they go, they're gone. They're gone, forever. yep. And you need to you need to do just a little bit of digging so you can come on and say, my sources are telling me that this team will yeah. be gone in five years. And then when – and then and – then, in a, in a future borderline episode five years from now, you can say I was in the hole on that. I told I'm so in the hole. I think I'm in the hole now. I'm gonna use I'm, I'm in the hole. I would say I you're on I would yeah. say I don't know if you're in the hole, but I'm I, on the I would say right you're now. yeah, I would I would say you you could possibly be on the on the you might have a foot um in the water. So you to, to speak. your point, if he truly <laughs> wants to stay, what is he doing? Yeah. There's, I mean, I mean, obviously he's an egomaniac, right? I mean, most self-made billionaires are, you know, usually they're pretty big with their egos, but I just, I mean, if you wanted to stay, you're doing it the exact wrong way. Mm. So yeah, yep. it's weird. And, and, I know and, and the rest of the country doesn't care. And maybe, and, and we gotta, we gotta move on here. Maybe, maybe yeah, by, yeah. maybe by selling, maybe by not going forward with all this stuff in Rock Hill. And now, now he's just, now he's just cutting bait, right? Just trying yeah. to cut bait and save expenses and and streamline everything, and uh, get it ready to go when they ask for the money and the city says no. They're like, all right, uh, see ya. I, I you could be. I, I hope you're wrong, but I don't Me know. Too. I think, like I said, I think you're on the board, an early and early board. on the board, early on the board call. I like it. Thanks, man. Yeah. <laughs> all right, let's uh, let's move on a little bit here. Um, and talk just a little bit of cornhole before we get to, although this would be a perfect segue because I've got some, you know, over, over the NFL weekend, over the football weekend, I hear all these um, footballisms, right? All these major, yeah. the, these major, and and so many things that I hear make me think about some some things that cross over to cornhole, which makes me happy because because our sport requires yeah. requires uh, there there's a mental prowess that you need and a physical ability. And, and uh, I know it may sound funny, but it's true. And so there's a lot of comparisons. Um, 
that, that I found over the weekend. But real quick, some cornhole. Uh, Myrtle yeah. Beach. Uh, I just want to get your thoughts on this. You and I talked about this on AC Live. But um, I, I, I do, I, I do, and and I really think that again, speaking of on the on the board and and in the hole, um, I really think that it, you know it it took me a minute for me to grasp whatever this new schedule is going to be with the pro series. Yeah. But but I really think that that I'm going to like this because I think it really in my head, and I could be wrong, and this is why I want to get your thoughts on it. I'm starting to feel like with this new pro series. You know where everything will really ramp up during the summer, and what is going to be potentially our new regular season of sixteen weeks and, and those eight events. That yeah. that these opens now, um, you know, it, in my mind, these opens are almost taking on a little bit more significance. Does an open in November do something for me? Eh, maybe a little bit, just to see some players, you know, and see if they're doing anything new for the new season, whatever. Yeah. But you get down to a New Year's Eve open, you know, on the cusp of here in a few months. Uh, starting our pro series, you know, our pro mm-hmm. season. Uh, this this open to me is something. I mean, I, I'm I'm not sure I'm not sure how much weight I'm going to put into it because it depends on how much weight the players put into it, and we'll find yep. out after we're there. But in my mind, Bernie, I'm 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 this is something for me. Like I cannot wait to see what happens here, and I think this could be a good barometer of what we see starting in April. What, what are your thoughts on that? I you know I, to a degree. I think it's different, uh, especially with some of the rookies. Especially, all right. So I think the Open Series is absolutely fantastic for people ranked fifty to two fifty. Right here's your here's your time to shine. Here's your time mm-hmm. to accrue points to requalify for next season. Here's your time to make some runs. Maybe make a little money in the Open Series. Maybe you know who knows. Right. I still think and believe because we've seen it happen the last few years that the pro the your elite pros they're really waiting for those big tournaments yes they want to win every time they play i'm not saying they don't but -hmm. everyone will see how different they are when you get to the the bigger tournaments and so i think the open series is great for your mid-level pros here's a chance let let me make a name let me let me get like let me put myself in a situation where i'm you know playing against these elite pros and i have to beat them and like so you start to it's a good way to gain confidence for that level but yeah i can play with these guys in a tournament yeah i can do this yeah i can beat them i know it so going into the bigger tournaments, they have that positivity going in. I'm still of the mindset that there's only about three or four opens that really get to a level talent wise, depth wise, that are more like our major, our national tournaments, that eight, that eight uh, tournament series that we'll have in the summer. Mm-hmm. There's only a few that kind of reach that level and it's depth of talent. And what people don't understand is like, all right, so if Mark Richards, Tony Smith, um, Devin Harbaugh and a few other guys show up, you know, it, you know, that means, you know, and you, and you do really well in that open. Well, look how well I did with these guys in it. It's like, that's fine. But when you can go 30, 35, 40 deep, when those opens really have that kind of traction, I think that you can and really point that open. Yeah. But some of the opens don't have that. They're very top heavy at best. Yeah. Yeah. And so, okay. that's a good point. And, yep. if, they're, and if they're not interested sometimes, not when I, not interested, the wrong way to say it. When they're not devastated by their losses the elite professionals, you know, if, they, if, if, they, if they're not feeling it in one of those and it's not, you know, they don't care. Mm-hmm. They don't, they can say they do. They don't. Yeah. Cause you see them walking around, you talk to them they're like, yeah, I'll be ready for April. You know? Well, maybe this will be, maybe this will be as the sport continues to grow and, and an influx of money comes in and the opens start to pay more, Agreed. You know, pay out more Then then maybe, then maybe, you know, you'll get, Agreed. That but that being said, as far as depth goes, this one coming up on new year's, you know, leading into new year's Eve. Feels pretty it, it, deep. It's, and I think it's deeper. It's getting deeper. Cause we, like the, the last registration deep. list we saw doesn't have people in it. Yeah, didn't have Jamie, didn't have Jack, didn't have uh, Alex Rawls, or maybe Alex was in there. But yeah, there were a few names that we found that we knew were going to be playing, right? Um, that weren't on there. But yeah, we yeah, it's 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 going to be deep. So that being said, uh, we did this on ACL Live for anyone who missed it. Though you want to just quickly go through our top five singles and top five doubles to watch. I don't think we need to spend a ton of time with this because sure. I'm sure a lot of people probably saw this on ACL Live on Monday. By the way, I had a blast with you. Yeah, yeah, it's fun. I, I, re- I really, I really like being live. It's, it's, it's fun. I know we drove everyone crazy doing our borderline thing, where we just kind of oh. go, you know, off the top. Well, because the Monday night, you know, it's very cornhole centric, right? It's those people are that's 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 only that's the only people watching it, 
and they don't care about when you and I start ranting and getting off down a tangent somewhere like we do with this yeah. show. And that's what makes this show great. But the ACL Live people are like, oh, oh God, here they go. <laughs> <laughs> They're yeah. doing it again. Here they go again. There Let's they go. Get to the point. God. Yeah, God. <laughs> We did though. Yeah, we did. Team. I mean, we eventually, we eventually got there. When we, when we got there, it was. We got to our top fast. five. Sure. All right. You want to do this? Another, Let's do this. Another award-winning performance. Yeah. All right. Uh, <laughs> yeah. We do. Yeah. Again, I don't think we have to spend much time with this because uh, you know we just hit it a couple days ago um, on Monday night. All right. Uh, go ahead. You want to give your top five singles to watch? Top five singles to watch. Uh, Ethan Walker, uh, obviously coming off a big open win where he swept. One of the only yeah. two people who have ever done that. Want to see where his head's at. Want to see where his game's at. Because, you know, like you've talked about bags on the board, a lot of them with the way he plays, right? Mm -hmm. So if his roll bag isn't at its elite, elite level, it's hard to win, right? Because it's going to be dirty. It's going to be very dirty. And it's hard to win when you're throwing threes and fours and fives and sixes, right? So anyway, but he has enough talent. He was, he played, he, I think he had a mid nines for the entire tournament in singles, which is pretty good for that style of player. Yeah. To be, to be quite honest. Alex Rawls, I don't know. Like, we're still not sure if he's playing coming off that he's surgery. Playing doubles. We don't know if he's playing. No, he's playing doubles. Yeah. So I've got him my singles to watch. So my bad. Ryan Trader, you know, exploded in the first open, which was super deep. And Rock Hill has had an amazing fall. Um, obviously, the kid has no fear. I think he's so young that he just doesn't care. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah, whatever. I'm good. Fine. You know, big deal. I I'm going to play Fortnite tonight. Yeah. And then uh, Jordan Power moving down to the Carolinas, you know, away from Michigan, yep. trying to get in a, in a deeper conference, if you will, is going to be closer to home. So how does he play closer to home? And then Colby Shear, another guy that I've heard so much about from the Carolinas folks. Well, here he is. It's Carolinas regional. I mean, Carolina, yep. a Carolinas open, you know, show us what you got. And that's where my five to watch. Yep, I like that one too. I think I had it in my mind. Uh, just real quick, let me correct myself. I said Alex not playing singles. He He's he's. He's. I think I. I would classify him. I guess if I was his coach, by saying uh, doubtful uh, right. at best, maybe game time. But he is going to play doubles. It's just hard for him right now, still with his foot, to go down and back in singles. I mean, to do that yeah. over and over and over. God yeah, forbid get he it. gets into a grind. Yeah. Um, and has to go down and back. Double doubles. He's in singles. Uh, doubtful, but he did say that he should be 100 percent ready to go for the for the pro series this year. All right, uh, my singles, see if I can pull them up. But yeah, I had Colby Shear. Uh, I, I guess the only, and I had uh, I had Allen and Alex Rawls on mine. Um, the, the only differences on mine were Nico Morales. And again, we spent a lot of time talking about this in ACL Live. I thought Nico had a really great moment out in California at the end of the season. Loved to, would love to see that again out of out of him and and because I, I i'm not sure that i've really seen the nico morales that everyone told me about when i came into the sport so i would love to see nico make that jump because not only do i like him as a person um uh, but he's just a great player um and i'd like to see him take that next you know championship yeah. level and we and, and we got into what i thought about all of that on acl live so i won't i won't delve into it but i think there are certain pros that might have a great three four months maybe five yeah. six months but then they kind of fall into the slot that their kind of talent is kind of made for I know yeah, that I sounds a great point. I, I know that sounds bad and people will get mad about that, but I mean, it's hard. There's a certain talent level to, with the elite elite players that's just different and everyone can see it. You don't have to be a cornhole aficionado to see it. You can tell yeah. like that person is a little bit better. Right? They have more they they've got more going on in their game. They can do more things or they're yeah. so proficient at one or two things that like a Mark Richards who is the most proficient player ever. At least, you know, he finds a way to be. It's, I think it's tough for guys like Nico to kind of break through, and they kind of fall yeah. back in their in their slot. We used to. I don't know if this is a good uh, analogy or not, because because I don't think this quite gives Nico enough credit, um, because he still is he still is a high level yeah. pro. Yes. We, we used to. Yeah. We used to. We used to call. We used to call a player in baseball. We used to call a player like that a four A player. Because as most of you know, the minor leagues consist consist of single A, double A, triple A, and then you have the major leagues. And for those guys who just would always be caught in between, right? They would yeah. they would crush minor league competition, right? I mean, if they played really? a single A, double A, triple A player, they dominate. They go up to the major leagues and just get lost in the shuffle and get sent back down. So they're constantly we call it a four A player. Yeah. So again, you know, are are there are there players like that in our sport? 
you and I kind of mentioned this on AC Live. Maybe we call him a slot player, whatever that would what whatever that would be. But I I think that's they've, they've still made it. it. I, I mean, they've made it to the major. I mean, this is our major league. That, that's the thing. It. That's why. That's why I'm saying top fifty, best. top yeah, and it's it's like they're there. They're a great player. Like and I and I feel like I've already gotten some stuff on this. By the way, I'm not saying they're not great players. I'm saying when you put them around the other great players, then where do you fit them in there? Yeah. Right. Because that's where I mean. I'm not a crazy person for saying that. I mean, there's rankings for a reason. This is where you fall, right? I mean, you've that's earned what, that space. You're you're talking about a golfer, right? Who's who's ranked in the 30s, ranked in the high 20s. He's he's yeah. still a pro. He's still on he's tour. Amazing. He's still making a crap load of money. He's still <laughs> yeah. a great player. Yes. But, but just hasn't found that that last fifth, yes. you know, that fifth gear yet to really. If you saw him play in person on a golf course, you'd be like, I can't believe people can do that. Yeah. Right. Yes, yes. But then, and Nico's like that. If Nico walked into some random bar somewhere and they had cornhole boards, people are like, oh my God, I can't believe people can throw like that. Yeah. Right. <laughs> but when you rate him against other elite, elite professionals, where does he really fall? So yeah. that's all I'm saying. Yeah. And Nico, I'm sorry, brother. I do, yeah. we do not. I, <laughs> But but to your I, point, all yeah, press is good press, Nico. Yeah, and <laughs> that Nico was that guy. But what what will you do with your game again? He had that moment in California. Can he can he hit that next gear and just and yeah and take his game to the next level? So we'll see. Uh, all right, moving on. Logan Chamberlain, and again, I it, all respect for Logan. And I mentioned this on ACL Live. I mentioned this on the show before. There are. Many players that I just love to watch. I love watching Logan Chamberlain play. I don't know why. I just do. We all have our favorites and players that we like to watch, right? I love watching Logan play. That being said, I'd love to see him do it in singles. So that's why I've got him on my players to watch uh, for Myrtle Beach. A terrific doubles player. He and Logan, uh, or he and uh, Justin Burton Jr. won their conference championship in doubles again. So terrific doubles team. Great doubles player. You put him with anybody in doubles, and he's going to kill it. I, I I just don't think that I've seen him yet at that level on the singles side. And I'd love to see it because I do, I do love watching him play. And then, and then we got to keep moving on here. But yeah, uh, I like, yeah. superstars, we talked about this last week. I mentioned her name. Another player to watch for me is Kaylee Hunter, coming off a really good open uh, in the last one. You know, can she do it again? We, you know, we we need superstars in the sport. I think she has all the ingredients. Um, if she can get, take her game to the next level um, and, and really start to make some noise uh, at a championship level. Sure. Um, I think it'd be great. So that wraps up our singles to watch. And then you want to do doubles real quick? We can. Sure. I've got uh, my five doubles started with Jeremiah Ellis and Ryan Hart. Jeremiah has had an amazing start to his rookie season. Yeah, rookie by that. name only. He's played a ton of cornhole in his life professionally. And then Ryan Hart. Ryan Hart's another one of those guys just like Nico Morales last season. Had a great run there for a while. Was really making strides. Yeah. And, but then where do you fit? Like, like, are, are you a top 15 player? Are you a top 25 player? Are you a top 40 player? Right. And so it's like, I think he's kind of trying to find out where he fits and trying to, you know, kind of build on that success he had last season. So playing those two guys playing well, looking at a Blaine Roser, Jordan Kimbrell, it's just gut feeling. Blaine was playing really well at the end of last season. Jordan Kimbrell always is better than people think. It's, you know, they, I don't think he gets enough of credit. He's one of these kind of overlooked, underrated players. Very often in in his home state, those guys always tend to play well in the opens. Yeah. Uh, Bella Suprinit, Noah Almanza, said it on ACL Live. Yep. With everything going on around her, she's always okay, going to be it. someone to pay attention to. But I think Noah's great because Noah's so calm, so you know, so, so cool. Really, when he's playing, that he's a perfect kind of foil for her. Uh, the the guys, Matt and Brett, you know, once maybe the most fear team in cornhole. Not so much anymore. And I'm wondering, you know, where where that what that does to them psychologically, you know, if they're able to kind of fight back and be who they once were. And then I have Alan Rawls, Cheyenne Bubenheim. Alan continuously is Alan, you know, all another guy that's underrated, but a top 10 player when you look at it, top 15. Yeah. And then Cheyenne being pregnant, she's going to be deep in her pregnancy. Like that has to be so uncomfortable. I just uh, I can't see how that wouldn't affect your game. So that's why her, her and Cameron, I mean, anytime those two girls are playing now, I mean, you have to pay attention because they're paying, they're playing deep in their pregnancies. I mean, uh, uh, Cameron's in her ninth month, right? She's, she's got to be pretty far along. Yeah. And that's crazy. Yeah. And playing up until her ninth month, that's good for her. Yeah. Cause I feel like it was a while ago when I saw something on Facebook. I mean, cause she was five months in, right. And they had found out what the gender of, of the yeah. child is going to be. So yeah, I mean, she's gotta be, she's gotta be getting, getting close to the home stretch there. 
Yeah. So, all right, good. Yeah, I like your list. My mine, I've got I've got similar uh, I've got s- similar ones on mine. Um, j- just a few that I had that you didn't. Um, Pat Sem playing with Kaylee Hunter. That'll be fun to watch. Uh, Jack Orr and Easton Caballero. I think that's gonna be fun to watch. I mean, Easton's just so young, right? I mean, just to, just to watch them play again. I'm not saying they're gonna win it. Just be fun to watch. Um, and then uh, I guess Justin Burton Jr. and Sammy Soto. I thought that'd be kind of an interesting one to watch too. Yeah, it is an interesting one to watch. But let's let's. Uh, so this this is a perfect segue because you bring up Brett Guy and Matt Guy. So I guess this is probably a great time to talk about. By the way, don't let me don't let me forget. We did get a couple of messages um, on Facebook. One, one for sure that I wanted to get to okay. before we run out of time. But just before I forget, um, so I, I heard this in um, over the weekend, um, and I can't remember who. It might have been on NFL Network, but but one of the pundits I heard. Um, <clears throat> so the, one of the most important things in the sport of football is that you have to have the ability to adapt and evolve. Right. Yes. You just have to whether whether, you know, we're old enough now to remember the, the whole West Coast offense. Right. When it when it came to um, I mean, it was everything in the NFL for a while. Uh, yep. The Tampa, too. But but, you know, as good as these offenses, as good as these defenses were, teams would always be able to adapt and evolve. And I think about with all these offenses now, all this all this, um, you know, misdirection stuff that they're doing and all the RPOs and and how all the teams are having to adjust. And and it got me thinking, it doesn't really matter the sport. And I think this is another, um, I think this can be another crossover into cornhole and, and, and you know, another, um, I don't want to say warning, but, but, you know, another tip for our players is that, is that I think to be a consistent championship level player, same thing, right? You have to be able to adapt and evolve. And I think I talk about these two roads, right? That the sport has collided, right? And we've got these two roads now that have developed. One of players who really are adapting, evolving, taking it to another level, whether it's nutrition, whether it's scouting. You know, I mean, numerous examples of taking their game to another next level. And yeah. then others who still are, you know, they still just want to drink and have fun. Nothing wrong with that. Make some money yeah. on the side, nice little side hustle. Nothing wrong with that. Right, much love for both. There's a there's a lane for both. But if right. you want to be at that high championship level, I think this is another thing that you've got to be able to learn how to do. And it got me thinking about the comment that you made, and I agree with you um, on ACL Live with Matt Guy. Is Matt Guy to that point like Bill Belichick? Right, Bill, Belichick has not been able to adapt and evolve without Tom Brady. You know, and look what's happened. I mean, it's it's just fall. It's it's gone off the cliff. It has has Matt Guy gotten to the point now where he needs to find some sort of way to adapt and evolve his game to get to a championship level? I think that's kind of what you were, you know, intimating the other night in ACL Live, and, and yeah. I, don't, I don't disagree with you. Yeah, I think that uh, you know, for someone that stays down the middle, he's always going to lead unless someone really starts playing at a high level with just slide shots. He's always going to be the lead PPR guy, you know, until someone finds a way to surpass him. Jeremiah Ellis, right now, number two. Yeah. in that field so that's interesting oh, but but it, there's not enough like i think matt's still a top 20 player top 25 player right he's still there he's still among the elite elite players of the game it wasn't that long ago that he would be first second name favorite in a big tournament i don't know if you would even list him in your top 10 favorites now and that for a player of that caliber that's been as that good for that long that yeah. has to eat at you it has to if you're compet- if you're a competitor, because we don't have a sport like a lot of the other sports, right? You're not going to get too old to throw the bag. Maybe you know at some point yeah. in your seventies or whatever. That's a great you know? point. Great. Yes. You know? You've got if you really want, to, you've got plenty of time to do it. But it's it's so so does he stay? This this is where maybe and you know what I, I should maybe I shouldn't be throwing this at you. It's not fair. Maybe we need to have like a you know Anthony or Trey on. Or Wally or something like that to talk about this task. I mean, is is there, you know, on the on the flip side, because because there's, I mean, because it's tough to age out of this sport and it has a longer shelf life. Mm-hmm. Um, can he just stay down the middle? And you know, and we'll, and you know, everything is cyclical in life, right? You and I talk about this all the time. You know, now that we're into our fifties, we've we've seen that. Yeah. Is he going to be okay staying down the middle? I don't know. I, I mean, think. I, I guess I'd love I, to ask Anthony. I, I in my, I don't think. Well, I think you get two different answers from Trey. I think you get two different answers from Trey and Anthony. Anthony's always going to be the proponent of a dirtier style game, right? He's always yeah. going to think, uh, you know, players that play that style, not really dirty style, but like a little, a little bit more of a cloth style bag, 
that's going to be a little heavier. I think he's going to always be a proponent of that. And I think Trey would be like, look, if he continues to be that kind of PPR player and then all of a sudden his airmail is hitting at an enormously high rate in a tournament, he could still win. Yeah. Big, big. But you're asking yourself to be in the 75 to 90% airmail range, which is – that's you're an alien if you can do that for a whole tournament. You know what I mean? Like that's crazy. Yeah. But it just got me thinking about your comment because I think it's so true, you know, that, 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 uh, and they threw Mike Tomlin in there, you know, you got, you've got to evolve, you know, you've, you've got, you got to find more creative ways to evolve yeah. and adapt. Well, so, yeah. you know, d- does Matt guy, I wonder if Matt ever thinks about this. Well, game. I think you what's getting lost in that game. I think what's getting lost in there that everyone knows, you know, when both those guys were good, when they had hall of fame quarterbacks. Yeah. Turns out you need a great quarterback to be great in the NFL. I don't care how good you can coach, right? I mean, like you can sit there, but if you don't have a guy and he's a game manager at best, you're not going to be that great. Even if yeah. you're coaching your tail off, you're just not. That that league is too competitive and too hard to compete in if you don't have a top, top quality player playing that position. I, I would push what, back on that a little bit, though. Tell me. Dak, Dak Prescott is not a high-level quarterback. I mean, Brock, that's your Brock, opinion. Brock Purdy, Brock Purdy is not Tom Brady. I mean, Tom Brady was a six-round pick. Well, it's, Tom, it's, what did Tom Brady do? What, From a physical perspective, not mental perspective, from a physical perspective, what did he do that was special? Nothing. Mentally, he was remarkable at, at reads and getting the ball out quick. Average arm at best. We know how slow he is. He's not a physical specimen. Those two guys you just mentioned are twice the physical specimen of Tom Brady. But coming out of college, Tom Brady was a six-round pick. Right? We're talking about Bert Purdy being a seventh-round pick. Like, oh, he's really not that good because he went that well. Tom Brady was in the sixth round. Yeah. Right? He made it. Look, if, if Drew Bledsoe doesn't get hurt, do we even talk about Tom Brady the way we do? I mean, there's got to be little things that happen along the way, but he was that good. And coaches get fired all the times because they don't have a quarterback that can play. And I just think that coaches sometimes forget that, yeah, they're, those Super Bowl rings they wear were because they had an unbelievable guy quarterback. And there's really only a but, couple but coaches. Just, that you, you're kind of making my argument for me, though, because you're saying that Tom Brady did not have great physical skills. Not physical and, skills, and but yet, mentally, yet, but mentally he, he was the best. Yet, but Mentally, yet they were still the able to win, and and that's what that's what I'm saying. I don't I don't think you. I think I think again going to the point of of being able to evolve and adapt. You know the Cowboys have done that with with Dak, and and the 49ers did it with Brock Purdy. Um, you know, I saw, I saw a really good quote. It's, it's, it's really more of the, the you know. The, I, the I don't know about Purdy because I saw a great quote from their coach today, actually this morning, and he was like. I can't remember what game he was referring to, but Brock Purdy, you know, 300 plus yards was more than a game manager. Prove yeah. to the coaching staff that he's more than that. And once they believe in the quarterback, then they can run whatever offense they want to run. Then they can open up the playbook and be as dynamic as they want to be. And I think that's what those guys give those teams, right? So I, I think yeah. it's unfair. Like I, I don't know, man. I, he, I think coach, I think coaching matters more at the collegiate level, personally. He's and I know crazy that, accurate. Brock Purdy is crazy, that's, crazy accurate. And that's what Tom Brady was super smart, the most accurate quarterback maybe ever. He I feel Bruce. like I feel like the I feel like the comp for me for Brock Purdy, and I've heard a few people say this, is Steve Young. Uh, or not Steve Young, sorry, Joe Montana. I, I never thought Joe Montana was a was a great athlete. <laughs> and, and he was just so he he was just he was smart. And he was accurate, and he didn't he didn't lose games for you. No, he was um, athletic, but a different kind of athletic. He was the kind of guy that could play any sport athletic. Yeah, but that that's 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 yeah. that's the only yeah. comp I have for Brock Purdy. And, and by the way, that that's perfect segue. So so one more thing, um, when I heard somebody talking about Brock Purdy, one of one of the great skills that he has is, um, and again, I can't I gotta start writing down who the who this was, but. Um, uh, oh, I know it was Mark Sanchez. Mark Sanchez said, "You know what the great thing about Brock Purdy is." He has amnesia. He's I swear he has amnesia. And he brought up several instances where where Brock Purdy might have gotten burned on one play, but then totally sure. forgot about it and came back to. and did the exact same thing. That's and, what makes them amazing. It, yeah, and it, and it got me thinking again about about the crossover to cornhole that is so true right. with cornhole right. because 100%. Because I remember t- talking to um, to to Moses and Peters Hasweta and talking to to their their dad, 
and and kind of on a similar thing because you know he pitched at a high level and was professional was a professional uh, baseball pitcher and he he you know one of, he said one of the greatest traits he had when he was p- pitching professionally was um you know when you give up just just a meatball pitch right and you give up a big home run what do you do afterwards you have to forget about it you have to instantly forget about that and yeah. he taught the kids same thing if you've got a bad round bad shot don't let it linger like forget about it and apparently apparently that's what brock has. brock has this just just ability to just just forget it and and he just and and just moves on and yeah. will do the exact same play. Doesn't doesn't let that image or that mental stigma stay in his head of throwing an interception. He'll do the same play, just make a better throw. But yeah, apparently, yeah. it's just crazy weird the way that he's just able to forget all that and, I think and not it even takes, dwell on it. I think I that's would. what. Yeah, I, of course. But that's what makes those. I mean, look, quarterbacks are quarterbacks, right? I mean, it's the reason yeah. they get all the girls, make all the money because they have, <laughs> and that I mean, they have a confidence level and an attitude level that's different from most of yeah. us, right? They're not. They, they're so confident in themselves that they just don't like the mistakes like, ah, eh, whatever. It's not going to happen again. Right. I can't, you know, I made that mistake once. I won't do it again. It's and like, true. To me, to me, I would be the exact opposite. Like, I can't believe I did that. I can't believe I did that. I can't. And then do it know, right, right away. And in our sport, when you're talking about it, we've been saying this for years. And this is what made Matt guy so great that he was able to forget his bad throws better than anybody, anybody. And it's another thing that separates the truly great from some of the average professionals is an average pro has a bad round where that bad round becomes three or four bad rounds because they're just so upset at themselves yeah. with a couple of decisions totally. they make. You know, what made Matt Guy so great, I think, a lot of times was, hey, bad round. All right, forget it. We're on to the next one. No big deal. Yeah. You know, even though he would show frustration and get mad, he still found a way to get refocused. And I think in our sport, you have to do that because they're human beings. Throwing at that distance, you're going to make some mistakes. Mm-hmm. And, and on the flip side, you know who I who I don't think had that great of ability was was Sam Darnold. You know, he's the guy. Remember when he was yeah. saying, "Man, I'm seeing ghosts." I mean, he just couldn't he just couldn't get he just couldn't get past some of those negative. Mental I would think things. it would be very difficult to be that guy for your entire life, and then your early 20s around other grown men. By the way, they're aware of what your contract is, and you're in a locker room with those guys, and you're not producing. And all of a sudden, for the first time in your life, you're having a crisis of confidence. That would be awful. Yeah. Because you're not going to find much help in that room. <laughs> you know? No. Yeah, you're right. You're right. <laughs> well, you know what? You know what really helps your confidence? I, I have no idea. When you say something on a podcast that someone agrees with. I'd let me know when that happens. <laughs> you, I, I'm, I'm about I'm to. sure it's happened for you. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm about to, I don't know. I don't know if it does or not. That's one of the crazy things about podcasts that I tell people, you know, when they, when people ask, you know, how do you like doing the show? I love doing the show. I really do. I mean, this is yeah. probably one of my, I mean this, and uh, it, it's kind of like a little bit like doing a sports talk radio show, but, but this is more open. I mean, it's more unfiltered. Right. I mean, it's, it's, I mean, when we say it, it's out there, it ain't coming back. Right. You know, um, <laughs> But, Trust but I love me. it. Trust but, me, I'm yeah. aware. <laughs> but I also love that. You know, yeah, I love that I part. Of, I love that it's very, very raw. Um, but obviously, I mean, just in life, you're going to get a lot of people who disagree with you. But uh, shout out to Christian, one of our listeners. Um, and again, please feel free, any of you, yes. to reach out to us. We love your questions, comments, things you like, things you don't Good, like. Bad and hit different. Us, yeah. Yeah. Hit us, hit us up. Uh, hit us up on our on our uh, Facebook accounts. <clears throat> so, Christian. He said, hey, Jeff, I, I just listened to Borderline this week and your point of bags on percentage and how DPR might not be the way uh, to track defensive stats. Uh, he said, what if you tracked and showed opponents bags on percentage and ranking as well as opponents bags off percentage and ranking or maybe a combined stat that would show someone's defense? He said, I think you are definitely on to something, though, uh, and got me really thinking about it. And then he also went on to say, thanks for what you guys do. You and Bernie do a great job. You are so much smarter and better looking and intelligent than Bernie, but it's okay. I still love to listen. <laughs> so, Christian, yeah, thank you so that, much that for the memo. Can, can, I, can I see Christian's last line there? I, I don't know if I... Yeah. See you. See you. <laughs> Trust me, it's there. Uh, <laughs> no, but uh, uh, no, Christian, no. Uh, thank you. He, he said, he, 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 said that he, he actually said that he always finds himself disagreeing with one of us. Oh, uh, I'm sure with, with every show. So, but I mean, that's the, loves, that's the point. Listening, though. So. That's the point. I think so. I mean, to, to yeah. get people thinking, if everyone agreed all the time, how boring would that be? Yeah. I, w- one of my favorite early when I was, when I was uh, an aspiring college journalist, 
Um, one of my favorite guys to listen to was Ron Barr on Sports Overnight America. Uh, you'd have to listen to him on an AM station. That's how old I am. Wow, there you and go. and his, but his saying was, "You take you, you right now. You take you just grab ten people out of my audience. Five people are going to love me. Five people are going to hate me. But I want all ten to respect me." He said, "That's when you know you've got a good show." And I've always I've always thought about that. So you're right. There's always going to be someone who 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 agrees, and always going to be somebody who yeah. disagrees. So, That's fine. But uh, but but Christian, so so two things. One, thank you for reaching out. Appreciate that. Secondly, so basically, what he's saying is is um, you know, so could we could we do some sort of metric where yeah. you have the opponent's bag on an opponent's bag off percentage? Um, we just you know, as, to as hire some sort of as, as yeah, as some sort of defensive metric. I actually was going to try and take a look at it. Uh, he said he doesn't have access to the stats, obviously, like we do. Christian, we don't have them either. I actually reached out to Trey. We, we, we will. We, we will have yeah. them. They they just haven't updated all that data yet. When it gets pulled down, I'll start looking at that. But you know, maybe there's something we can do. Um, and gosh, we're gonna run out of time. I'll yeah, we are. Quick. We can talk about it more next week. Um, maybe maybe there's something we can do. I'll take a look at it when I get all the metrics in baseball. Right, one of my favorite stats. For you know what kind of what kind of trouble you get into, what kind of uncomfortableness you have as a pitcher is yep. whip, and and whip is sim- is simply um, walks and hits per innings pitched. So it, it basically is a metric of how how many how many people are you having to deal with that are on base while you're on the mound, and that's one of my favorite stats in baseball. Um, so you know, can we do something like that to come up with a defensive metric? Yeah. I, I I think I'm sure something theoretically we could come up with anything. Yeah, theoretically we could come up with any stat that we wanted. The problem is having the uh, manpower and the infrastructure to handle all that information throughout a season. Yeah, but is there but, is there something there with the stat? Because we do keep a lot of stats. Is there something we there keep it? But someone has to break. Yeah, someone has to break it could, all down. We could come up with some sort of formula. Yeah, to do yeah. that. I don't know. Yeah. Um, but then but then he also agreed with DPR, and I think people are coming around on that now with the DPR. Um, give me quadrants. I mean, at, at the very least, give me just like in college basketball. Let's just let's just steal that. What's what's your quad one DPR? Now we're talking. You know, if, if you give me a quad one DPR that's solid, now I'm like, okay, that's two fifty six. Let's divide that into what you take those. You divide that into four. So what is that? Thirty forty. Might have to break it down even more, right? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, your your quad ones would be top fifty in essence. Um, I mean, do you, do you even take out do you even take out the the, the bottom two fifty six? Do you just make it fifty? You know, top fifty, top hundred, one fifty, two hundred. Just take out the bottom fifty six. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe because it yeah. opens op- opens it kills you because you have advanced players. You don't even have professionals playing in the opens, mm-hmm. right? So you got a whole different you know section that you have to put those folks. Yeah, but, and some of them are great players. Don't get me wrong. Some of them are professional level players that for whatever reason just don't want to make that leap. Right. So. Yeah. All right, dude. A lot more to talk about. We got a motor yep. to get yep. to. We're, we're not doing power rankings this week. Uh, congratulations to Mark. Big win. He and Tony squared off head to head. Of most, as most you know, one and two players, and Mark Mark won it. No change in our power rankings. So let's get to on, off, and in. I love the smirk on your face. What, what's what's going on with your on, off, and in? I, it's silly. I mean, the, the last one's very silly that most people will not get. All right, on the board. Hollywood is giving us a complete view into the decline of our society. They haven't written a good movie in probably a decade. Except for I'm going to show you my in the hole is going to be a little bit against that. There's been a few, but not many. But if you go back, just just go back from like 1980 through 2005. Right. Just go back and look at the uh, movies that were up for best picture for the Academy. Like You'd be like, oh, my God, that movie was so great. That movie was so great. Like, And now it's like. How many Avenger movies can we make? Like, there's just there's nothing, there's there nothing coming those, out, yeah. nothing coming out of real substance. And so, no. you know, it's just because they know who their market is, and the only reason they're doing that, if, if if they realize that, you know, hey, we've got this really bright intellectual group of people, we want to market this movie. No, just give them a bunch of explosions and some cartoon stuff, and they'll be fine. And that's where we are. <laughs> <laughs> I will have to take your word for that because uh, I was obviously I was busy uh, raising kids. So uh, your, your, your movie, your movie, your movie knowledge is is way better than mine. However, yeah. I, I I mean just off the top of my head, yeah, I I, I would agree. I mean the, I can't think of a real big blockbuster. I did see Napoleon. Kathy and I went and saw Napoleon. Oh, you've already seen it? Don't tell yeah, me. I it, was, I it, see it was good. 
it was really good. Um, I really liked it. So I haven't uh, seen well, Oppenheimer yet, but we'll see. I haven't yeah. seen that either. I've de- I, I definitely will take your word and respect your thoughts on that, though. So, all right. You got your off the board. We got like five oh, yeah, minutes. Yeah. Off the board. I was way off the board. I didn't think the playoff structure in college football would ruin the bowl structure. I thought the bowls would fit in and be fine. I was wrong. It has completely destroyed it. And now going to 12, probably don't need them anymore. Uh, other than – the other conferences. I think the power five teams, if they don't make the, the top 12, should just not do it because half the kids that are going to the, to the pros aren't going to show up. You know, you've got your transfer portal. So like North Carolina, for example, obviously I know more about it. They have seven starters not going well behind those seven starters. A lot of those guys transferred. They're going to be playing with walk-ons a lot all over the field. I mean, that's not, so why pay to go see that? Right. Right. I mean, I think it's just absolutely ruined uh, the, the bowl structure. So I was way right. off. I totally agree with you. I think the only way, and I and I mentioned this years ago, I think the only way, when they went to four teams, I think the only way you could have possibly saved the Bulls, um, you can't do it with four teams, but yeah. the only way to save the Bulls um, would would be to have a 32-team playoff like they used to do. In, uh, wasn't it, was it 32 in, in uh, one AA, Division 16. one AA? 16. 16. Okay, well, you do a 32-team playoff, so you have, so you have um, 16 games, right? And it's 16 bowls. Each game is its own separate bowl game. Yeah. And you whittle it down that way. But yeah. I'm also not a fan of 32 teams because I don't think it devalues the regular season. We've had this discussion before. Yeah, we can go down that road if we want. But I think that's the only way. It, and then my in the hole kind of goes with my on the board. The most subversive yet aspirational movie I've seen in a long time, Barbie. Oh, my gosh. It, I, I've heard people... Uh, I really don't think a lot of people that saw it got it, but she, it's, it was it's really subversive. Yeah, there's she takes a lot of shots, but yet at the same time, she's get, like it's it's pretty good, man. And I, I know our listeners aren't really good. into that sort of thing, but they should try it out. Yeah, it's good. I've heard it was good. I've heard it was really and good. Okay. you know she's taking her shot at the patriarchy, right? She's female director, female writer, but yet the best role in the movie is for a guy. I mean, it's little oh, things right? like it's little things like that. It's it's funny. Yeah. All right. Uh, for the sake of time, I'm not sure I'm going to get to all of mine. I'll do my on and my off. Um, I'll say maybe I'll save my in for next week because it could it could, it could uh, have some legs for next week. All right. So my on the board, uh, Will Levis. Um, I, I I said this long ago, even before the draft, that I would have taken Will Levis. I would have taken him over Bryce. I would have taken him over CJ. All right. Now CJ is, you know, pretty I, good. Sure. Yeah, he's pretty good. But I would have taken Will Levis over both those. And if and if I were the Panthers, I would have I would have. I, I would have not made that trade for one thing, because I think you could have gotten Will Levis in the second round. You could have gotten someone or 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 a um, uh, Anthony could have, Richardson could have gotten uh, could have gotten him later. The, the, the number like of players, guys. I don't know about and, Anthony Richardson necessarily. Oh, but the, no, the, I'm just saying at the time this yeah. day, this is my on off and in. This is not yours. I, I hear you. I'm letting and, you go. I, I'm saying at the time I thought I, I would have taken Will Levis and Anthony Richardson before Bryce. I would have taken I would have taken a much bigger need. Right, because I I think you could have gotten Will Levis later. Sure enough, Will didn't go until the second round. Sure. The Panthers could have gotten him in the second round. I mean, I and look at what, what Will Levis is doing. I'm I'm only saying I'm on the board because it's it's a small sample size. Dude is a player. Yeah, he is he's he is a grinder. He is tough. I lo- he is everything that I love about an NFL quarterback. He's big. He's got an arm. Love it. I would have taken him. And, and I mentioned this ten times out of ten over Bryce. So on the board with that. Off the there board. Uh, the NBA in in season tournament. You know, I, when I first heard about it and read about it, I didn't watch any of it because I thought it was sticky. But Me too. but I got to tell you, it had some legs, Bernie, and it was popular, and the ratings were really good for this in season tournament. And the and fact the, that it was single elimination, and the fact, of course, that the Lakers were in it helped too. But the ratings were really big. They, the NBA had the highest ratings they've had in six years because of this in season tournament. And now I'm kind of sad that I missed it because I do like basketball. I do like the NBA. I normally don't watch until the end of the season because there's nothing to watch. But yeah. uh, this, this had some legs, so I was off the board. I thought it was going to be sticky, but it, it, was, it was a thing. I'm with you. Thing. Agreed. Um, okay, you know what? I got 30 seconds. My in the hole, great neighbors. We have the best neighbors over here. <laughs> and our neighbor, our neighbors have two kids, and, and their names are Maverick and Jagger. I mean, how about that? I mean, how I mean, when you have neighbors with, who name their kids Maverick and Jagger, you know they're gonna be yeah. cool. But anyway, so so the mom kind of have to be here, you're in big trouble, right? Yeah. So the mom Heather the, the, she likes to cook to make cookies with the kids and they bring the cookies over here. I mean, they're, they're the best neighbors ever. So in the hole, we're lucky to have great neighbors. 
Hey, man. Do that, but you filled it up. Let it go. Merry early Christmas. We did fill it up as always. <laughs> and now we're over. Uh, All right, man. Cool. Uh, have fun on ACL Live. Great to see you. Have a good weekend, and we'll talk to you next week. See you. All right. Bye, everybody.